Greetings, everyone. Steve Cole here, and this is your refresher training on opioids, and I hope you enjoy this. So my name is Steve Cole, and I'm with uh, a small agency in southwest Idaho, or a mid-sized agency, I guess I should say. I've been doing this for about 30 years, and I'm currently an EMS training captain and adjunct faculty in my area. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I will warn you, though, is that while this picture looks all prim and proper, this is more the type of person I am. So if I drop an F-bomb or I say something out there that's just a little bit on the oddball side of things, I'm going to apologize on the front end. Please don't hold it against me. Now, when we do these educational presentations, um, for accreditation purposes, we often have to write up a list of learning outcomes and objectives. And actually, if we're doing it right, we're probably writing those first before we do the presentation. And then we publish those and we put those on present on the uh, slide deck and people just gloss over them uh, because they often make your eyes cross reading them. But what I've done here is I've taken these objectives. And I've translated them kind of just everyday street level uh, questions that might uh, that might help you understand what we're going to get out of this presentation. So we're going to talk about the different types of opioids. We're going to talk about how opioids work. We're going to talk about what a patient who is experiencing an overdose, what their clinical presentation is. We're going to talk briefly about how people uh, use opioids and some of the risk factors for opioid overdose, not just recreational use, but actual overdose uh, when things go wrong. We're going to talk about how you actually treat these opioid overdoses, and we're going to wrap up with uh, some specific reasons and spe special circumstances when you might want to treat them different and maybe not give them naloxone uh, that you... Um, hopefully that'll be useful for you as well. And that's going to take up quite a bit of time, so we're going to get right into it. First and foremost, understand that this is not a uh, basic, this is not a substitute for basic clinical judgment. If you are going through this, whether an EMT or your paramedic, having some common sense and having some clinical judgment is essential uh, for good medical care. So that takes precedence. Uh, also, medicine evolves. Your understanding of medicine should evolve with it. Uh, I always like to compare drug knowledge, particularly street drug knowledge, uh, street toxicology to a computer. And by that, I mean that your computer probably has a uh, estimated a short lifespan of relevance uh, of about two years before it starts to become obsolete. Uh, and so I would say that probably that's true of our street drug knowledge as well. Every two years or so, you will get there'll be a new big, huge drug that the newspapers and the periodicals will make a big deal out of. You'll often find out that it's been around forever, but now it's the great big, huge thing. Uh, or there'll be a new way of using an old medication or uh, street drug. There'll be something change that'll change every two years or so. So be prepared to update. And if you're still basing your opioid knowledge off what you learned in paramedic school five years ago, 10 years ago, I can promise you you're out of date, even on something as simple as opioids. So I guess the moral of that story is educate and re-educate and continuously educate yourself. Uh, that is absolutely cr crucial. Now, where do you get that education from? Well, I'm going to piss off some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, textbook publishers, but textbooks are especially paramedic textbooks are not where you want to get your most uh, current information from uh, even though they may meet the current guidelines most information what they base on the principles the strategies are at least five years sometimes 10 years out of date sometimes more so uh, they are not uh, definitely not uh, cutting edge or early adopter phase at all or even mainstream i would say so where do you look well here are two textbooks I have on my desk or on my shelf, and I would recommend that every astute paramedic get a version of this. One is Gold Frank's Toxicology, and the other one is Lang's Basic Clinical, uh, Basic and Clinical Pharmacology. Both these are considered textbooks, but they are much more robust, much more in depth, and much more respected than the paramedic textbook you may have in front of you. Now, I will tell you also that uh, they're expensive, so. Uh, if you were to buy the latest and greatest version of these, you're probably spend two to three hundred dollars on each of them or thereabouts. So don't get the edition before you'll save two, three hundred dollars and get them for like 30, 40, 50 bucks each. Uh, and they will serve you quite well for most of your basic research. Um, that's that's what I do. Um, unless you have an organization that's going to buy you the latest and greatest, unless you have 
uh, an academic institution, uh, unless you're counting them off for taxes, it's probably you're going to get almost as good uh, textbooks by buying one edition older. So people go, well, why do I need textbooks when I can go on the Internet? Well, you are correct, uh, but the Internet has its perils. So if you're going to do uh, Google searches for uh, medical uh, knowledge, then I would probably start with Google Scholar rather than Google himself. Uh, I would also, uh, when we talk about street drugs, there's a website called arrowwood.org. Now, arrowwood.org is a pro-drug harm reduction website. Uh, they are, uh, but as far as that goes, they are really reputable, and they've been around for at least 15, 20, probably closer to 25 years or more. I'm not, I'd have to go back and look. But but I've used them, and I have nothing good things to say about this. So you have to understand that when you uh, look at Arrowwood, uh when you look at any site, never use a single site, a single source for any of your information. But I will often use Arrowwood if there's something that pops up that I'm not familiar with and it's a little bit more obscure, uh, especially the psychedelics and the uh, a lot of the plant-based uh, drugs of abuse. A lot of times I'll start there, I'll do my search there, and I'll see where it takes me, and then I'll look for multiple other sources. So my, my uh, research journey does not end with Arrowwood, but often it will start there. In this day and age, we have to talk about foam and foam ed. And what we're talking about foam and foam ed is free open access medical education, podcasts, blogs, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of good ones. Life in the Fast Lane, uh, Flight Bridge, um, MCRIT, so on and so forth. When it comes to street toxicology, one I really like is called the Dantastic Mr. Toxin Howard Show. Uh, this is also, a, it's a podcast. I think they're probably about 15 now. And there are a couple of wackadoo, kind of weird toxicology guys. I think one of them also is board certified toxicologist and board certified emergency medicine. Uh, it's very lighthearted, but it goes into some neat stuff. And uh, not all of it's EMS related or EMS pertinent, I should say, but a good portion of it is. And it's just enjoyable. And you'll be surprised at the knowledge you pick up. So I recommend this. It's also known as the Tox and the Hound Show uh, because it's dual published on the MCRIT family of websites as well the mcrit uh being from scott weingarten company there's other ones taming the shrew uh the first 10 em uh, a few others all of which are are good to look at so let's talk about how opioids work and where do opioids come from uh well the opioids come from the opium poppy opium poppy is a naturally occurring plant we have papyruses and other documentation of opioid use and abuse going back at least 4,000 years to the ancient Egyptians. Um, so uh, let's just say there's a long-standing clinical, <laughs> clinical history, of, of pharmaceutical history of it. Now, interesting enough, the bulb of the poppy plant, can, uh, when you slice it, will excrete a latex or a sap, is it sometimes called? A liquid um, that contains mostly opioid alkaloids. Now, there's a whole bunch of them, but there's four main ones that we're worried about or concerned about, and that's morphine, codeine, thebane, or ripavine. And uh, these are the drugs that uh, both your uh, naturally occurring opioid alkaloids and your semi synthetics are derived from. When we talk about opioids, we need to talk about opioid receptors. And a lot of times when you hear opioid receptors, you might not realize that there's a whole bunch of different ones and they all are not the same. So the the biggest prominence, we'll get my uh, laser pointer here, are the mu receptors, the mu opioid receptors. And there's four of them. There are also three, de or sorry, two delta receptors, three kappa receptors. And there's this one down here called the non-opioid non -opioid orphan receptor. And it's... Um, these all work in synergy with each other and very seldom do does any opioid just have mu receptors or kappa receptors or delta receptors they often will uh, have a few of all of them now the reason why this is important i don't expect you to memorize all these and this is quite a bit of a discussion that'll certainly make your eyes cross but the biggest thing is to understand is that narcan naloxone only affects mu receptors and this is one of the reasons why you can give somebody naloxone and you may not, they may not come completely to, depending on the type of opioid they're abusing, depending on the other effects, depending on the other drugs they take as well, 
you can see why naloxone is not a uh, complete pharmacological antidote. So what does a patient looking, what does an opioid overdose look like? In this picture that you see here, this is from, uh, I want to say, Ohio in 2016. Um, and this was actually a picture uh, it's from East Liverpool, Ohio, when I look at my notes, from 2016-ish. And the, these this couple overdosed in front of their kid in a car. And then this is, uh, I think, from the body cam footage uh, when they were uh, responding to this this couple. So when we think about what an overdose looks like, it's it helps us cognitively to organize their symptoms into toxidromes. And we have all sorts of uh, toxidromes and toxicology and even syndromes in EMS. So when you think about this, what is a toxidrome? Well, if you think about a syndrome, and you think about a syndrome as a collection of symptoms that when you group, group them together in certain contexts, they imply a certain disease process chest pain with shortness of breath radiating to the left arm and diaphoresis is a t syndrome that implies a cardiac event a toxidrome is nothing more than a group of symptoms that imply a specific specific toxicological cause a toxidrome is essentially a toxic syndrome hope that makes sense so the opioid toxidrome, you'll hear that term used a lot, toxidrome. The opioid toxidrome consists of altered mental status, meiosis. And you're thinking, what is meiosis? Meiosis is pinpoint pupils, uh, unresponsiveness, decreased or shallow respirations, decreased or, or slow respiratory rate, decreased bowel sounds, or uh, decreased gastric motility, which in turn is directly uh, related to sometimes the bowel obstructions you see with chronic opioid abuse and hypotension. Now, it's worth noting that meiosis, hypotension, and really quite a few of these symptoms aren't always, are both aren't specific to opioids and don't always occur with opioids, particularly when you mix multiple other drugs or clinical conditions into them. For example, a patient who's been down a while and is very acidotic, their pupils might dilate. A person that has uh, stimulants on board, their pupils might dilate. They might not be hypotensive, they might be hypertensive, so on and so forth. Now, I want to talk a brief bit about meiosis, particularly because I've seen this happen on more than a few occasions. So if you're tuning out, tune in for this. Meiosis doesn't just occur with opioid overdoses. We also see it with two other conditions that we need to talk about. One is organophosphates. Now, I work in an area that has a lot of agricultural industry. We have a lot of uh, migrant farm workers uh, in the area where I live. And they do all the stuff you do when you work on a farm, including mixing pesticides. And we've had cases where uh, we've had multiple victims from pesticide organophosphate toxicity. And of course, they, among other things, they have pinpoint pupils and all the other symptoms. The sludge mnemonic, if you remember that, the sludge is a toxidrome also. So you don't want to confuse one for the other. You don't walk up on a situation and see two or three uh, guys on the ground uh, and see pinpoint pupils and assume that's an opioid overdose. You need to take the whole context the situation is. And this is particularly worrisome for me because it does happen a fair amount. And organophosphates are specifically a, um, a hazard, not just to the patient, but to the responder as well. So just a little word of advice. Probably what I've seen more often than organophosphates, though, are hemorrhagic strokes mistaken for opioid overdoses. And I have personally seen this on more than one occasion. And this usually happens in the elderly patient, not always, but the times I've seen it's been an elderly patient. They're found down in their home. They are unconscious, unresponsive, and they have pinpoint pupils. And then uh, an enterprising uh, provider looks at their medications, says, oh, they have a prescription for OxyContin. They have a prescription for Norco. Almost everybody who's over the age of 55 <laughs> seems to have a prescription for a painkiller at some point in their life or another. Doesn't mean that they're an overdose. So you need to look at the total clinical picture. You need to look at their, their presentation, see if it matches up with their toxidrome, see if there's other indications of opioid use, misuse, or abuse. Frequently what you'll find with uh, these bleeds though, these are pontine bleeds. 
Now, pontine bleeds are bleeds in the, are hemorrhagic strokes, particularly in the pons of the brain, which is in the back of the head near the medulla oblongata. And what you'll see is pinpoint pupils. You will also see um, irregular breathing patterns, but they won't always be slow. It may be chain stokes or boits or something like that, but you have to physically look and have that in the back of your brain to notice that because it gets overlooked a lot. They may not be hypotensive. In some cases, they may be hypertensive. Um, in which case, um, you know, that would be very atypical for an opioid overdose. Now, the reason this is important is a lot of these pons, uh, pontine bleeds will, will degenerate to the point if they aren't already there where they need airway control. And then if you end up slamming a bunch of Narcan, you're delaying airway control, but you're also giving a, a narcotic antagonist. And most agencies have an opioid as part of their post innovation sedation protocol. So you're actually working against yourself downstream. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying that you shouldn't give naloxone or you should. Uh, I'm saying you need to use clinical judgment. Another thing I want to talk about that you'll see with uh, the presentation of opioid overdoses is elevated in tidal CO2. And this is actually, um, and, and I personally, the highest I've seen is 117. Uh, I've had a, a co-worker of mine that saw a entitled CO2 of 120 a few weeks ago on an opioid overdose. Uh, seeing above 70 would be completely within the normal range. Uh, the biggest thing, though, is that um, you want to be careful how you respond to this. Many times what I see is if you see an elevated entitled CO2, one of the first things people do is they want to bag it down to a normal range. The rapid bagging can have adverse hemodynamic effects. It can bottom out the pressure. It can cause all sorts of other problems, and it won't fix the entitled CO2. So what do you do? Well, what we want you to do is to basically ignore the reading. Do not try to bag them down. Instead, use entitled CO2 to gauge your respiratory rate, to make sure your tube's in place, and support the body while its natural buffering systems take over and in hours will help correct itself. Um, you're just, just going to cause more problems than you could ever possibly solve by overbagging these patients to the extent it would need. Uh, in the cases I'm familiar with, like I think I may have already said it, it took about four or five hours before their entitled CO2 got down to 70 even. So um, just be cognizant of that. So you'll see it, use it as, oh, well, understanding that matches your clinical presentation, understanding what's going on, but either it corrects itself or it doesn't in the time you have them, don't overbag them. Don't chase the number. Control the respirations, put them on a vent if you have that available and uh, treat everything else that's in front of you. Let's talk about how people abuse opioids a bit. So interesting enough, um, opioids, if you can get it inside the body, it can be absorbed and abused. It's very easily, uh, um, the clinical effects are very easily obtained that way. Obviously, some routes are probably more effective than others. But we see people who do it via intravenous route. They do it intradermally. They do it uh, intramuscularly or a combination thereof to prolong the effects. They chase the dragon, which is where you might put it on a piece of moon foil or on top of soda can. You heat it from, up from bottom and the vapor effect is what you inhale. And a lot of times they'll do that because the flame itself destroys. Uh, it's not very efficient. It destroys a lot of the product. You'll see people freebasing. Uh, not very common anymore. It used to be quite common uh, back in the 70s and 80s where they would mix uh, opioids with a base. And then they could apply flame directly to it and smoke it. Plugging and shelving is essentially mucosal absorption. The case, in this case, the mucosal membranes are the mucosal membranes of the vaginal vault and rectal vault. So they will literally place it up into the vag vagina or up into the rectum for absorption. Now, most commonly, you'll see this as an accidental overdose where they are transporting as a mule um, baggies or some other... Um, container with the opioid in it and that it'll break and then they'll absorb it. Uh, you'll have dirty hits, uh, which are in just infected uh, injection sites. I haven't seen this for probably 10 or 15 years, but uh, occasionally it would pop up uh, opioid tea. People would make a tea and they'll often mix it with grapefruit juice, uh, not for flavor, but interestingly enough, grapefruit uh, inhibits the detoxification of the opioid out of your system through 
hepatic metabolism. So, um, or he hepatic processes rather. And so the grapefruit juice inhibits that. So it actually has a longer clinical effect. And that also means an increased chance of, um, of, um, uh, accumulation, accumulative, accumulative related overdoses. Uh, you also occasionally see tinctures. Now you may have heard of laudanum or paragoric, probably laudanum on like tombstone and old wild west movies. Believe it or not, laudanum and paragoric are still in the United States pharmacopoeia. So you could still in theory, go to a compound pounding pharmacy where they, uh, compound the, uh, um, prescri prescribed medications and get laudanum today. It's, uh, if it's in a tincture, it's in a suspension of a sweet alcohol based solute and the opioids are solvent, uh, paragoric, very similarly. Now, both these t in contemporary use, and I say contemporary, it's not very common. At all are usually prescribed as for antidiarrheal effects, but there are a lot better uh, compounds out there for that, for that than a lot of them are paragoric, but it's a possibility. Matter of fact, it's on my bucket list. I want to have one of my physician friends write me a prescription for laudanum. I want to go get it. I want to frame it uh, with a little shadow box right next to it just as a novelty item. But so far, none of my uh, physician friends are willing to do that for me. Okay, let's look at why people overdose. Uh, what we know is that we've already discussed on how they overdose as far as how the drug gets in their system. Let's look at why, what the common patterns are. And when we look at this, there, you know, some things are pretty self-explanatory. One of the biggest ones is IV opioid use. Now, the reason why IV opioid use is so dangerous for uh, recreational use and abuse is that almost all of the compound, the opioid compound, and whatever else is in there with it is immediately available, biologically available, immediately on injection. To put it in contrast, uh, if you take a pill orally of Oxycontin, Oxycodone, whatever, before it goes into the systemic circulation, the liver gets a pass at it, what we call first pass hepatic metabolism. It goes through the liver first, where the liver can detoxify up to 60 to 80% of it before it hits systemic circulation. So quite a bit of it is removed. That doesn't happen with IV drug use. Also, when you ingest something orally, it's absorbed over a period of time. Sometimes that time, period of time is short, sometimes it's not. But when you inject something intravenously, it is immediately available. So these things combine to make IV drug use uh, of all types the riskiest. I would also add, now there were several studies done on this, um, but uh, a lot of those were done before intranasal opioid use was really common. But I would add that intranasal opioid use has many of the same risk factors that IV opioid use does. Another one is the polypharmacy overdose. When people start mixing uh, their compounds, um, whether we talk about uh, multiple different CNS depressants, uh, alcohol uh, in combination opioids is, a, uh, is an emerging trend, uh, or whether we talk about like with uh, stimulants and opioids, whatever it is, uh, when you mix your opioids, you have a much more complex toxicological situation so that even if somebody's there to apply rescue therapy, such as naloxone, it may not be enough. We also see when people return to opioid use from abstinence. Now, maybe they were locked up in jail. Maybe they were uh, successfully through a rehab program. Maybe they had been sober for months, weeks, months, even years. And then suddenly they come back and they try to use a similar amount to what they had before, but they don't have the tolerance that's developed. Um, remember that opioids, just like alcohol, develops a tolerance. And what you have is that when you stop using them, you lose that that tolerance for drugs so a little bit goes a lot farther and then these people get in trouble i've seen this on numerous occasions where sometimes patients will get little parties thrown for them when they get out of jail and then their girlfriend their boyfriend their significant other tries to give them a similar dose to what they took before they went into jail you know it's only been three four months and boom they go down now, when I talk about the weekend warrior on here, the weekend warrior, I'm not talking about the National Guardsman or the reservist. I'm talking about the person who is opioid naive and they're just at a party. They're doing, yeah, and they're just, somebody puts in front of them and they try and they don't know what they don't know and they get themselves in trouble that way. When you talk about using opioids alone, I'm not talking about just using solely opioids. I'm talking about using it without a buddy. And just like you wouldn't go into, um, into a swimming pool without a buddy, you wouldn't go into, 
uh, the battlefield without your battle buddy. Uh, you really shouldn't be using opioids alone because then if something goes awry, there's nobody to call for help, apply rescue therapy, or even uh, notice that you've passed and um, bad things happen. And finally, a new supply of drug. This kind of goes along with uh, returning from abstinence. You have a uh, somebody bringing a new supply of the drug. It's um, either more potent than normal or it has another drug mixed in what we call a polyopioid uh, compound and to increase its potency, and you have people overdosing that way. And we've seen that happen time and time again. Interestingly enough, uh, I think the uh, DEA uh, reports that the average purity of heroin in the 1980s and 70s was about 30, 30%, and today it's about 80%. So even that alone has increased over the years. Now, when I talk about polyopioid and polypharmacy overdoses, when I talk about polypharm, here's two the most two most common examples I'm familiar with, certainly not all inclusive. You have Cizerup, which is a polypharmacy compound of codeine, a CNS depressant, alcohol, a CNS depressant, and Finnegan, which has CNS depressant properties. And these also have other properties as well, each unique to their drug class. And this is commonly used in uh, the college age, age party scene, the rave scene, uh, hip hop scene. Uh, I think there was even a hip hop song on this or two that uh, pushed in popularity. Uh, so this is a concern now. I'm, I'm and this often also has Jolly Ranchers and stuff in it. I don't know why, but I'm thinking about this and I'm looking at the compound and honestly, it makes me a little nauseous. <laughs> Maybe that's why the Finnegan's in there. It makes me a little nauseous. It'd be like drinking straight cough syrup that fizzles. The other one, and we've seen this for decades, uh, speedball. Now speedballs. Uh, used to be cocaine and heroin, but mo modern use, it's really just an opioid and a stimulant. So opioid could be heroin, could be fentanyl, could be anything else. And uh, the stimulant could be cocaine, could be methamphetamine, could be any of your cathinones, which are commonly called bath salts, uh, anything along those lines. So um, the issue with that is you have the opioid, which is almost a mitigating effect. And then if you give naloxone, you have the stimulant, whatever it is, running rampant and all the bad things that happen with that. So you can have VTAC, you can have hypertension, you can have delirium, you can have uh, extreme combativeness, so on and so forth. So you need to be cautious. Ask questions before you just give naloxone. Now, this is different from the polyopioid overdoses. And this is, we really think about these coming into their heyday, starting about 2015 or so, but I can be I can honestly tell you that this probably was an issue way before then, because we've there are reports of small batches of super heroines or extreme potency heroines, uh, at least back to the 2000s that I remember, um, that would come and go. And probably what we see most of these is we're seeing a drug such as heroin uh, mixed with a higher potency drug such as one of the fentanyl analogs. And the idea is, Heroin particularly has a, for lack of a better term, a flavor. It has a very strong euphoric property that fit, most of fentanyls do not necessarily have. But you mix, take the fentanyl, you mix it in to increase the potency, but you retain the, fit, uh, the heroin for its euphoric properties. And now what you have is you have a much more potent compound that is much more economical on the, for the drug dealer to sell and distribute and cut. And that's that's why it is. Nobody does this because it's uh, just for a better... better um, recreational experience they do it because they make more money at it the problem is of course is you is that the quality control in these compounds is not existent and you can have some people that get really potent batches and some people that get subpotent batches and uh, that's how people overdose so in essence just because they're shooting heroin doesn't mean they're actually shooting heroin that's just what they think they bought now, uh, carfentanil is probably the one that's been the biggest, uh, mo most publicized culprit, but that's part, not just the only one out there. There's other opioids. There's other fentanyl analogs, uh, quite a few, actually. Carfentanil is just the one that made the news. Carfentanil is extremely potent. It's used for uh, taking down big game. And big game, I mean elephants, rhinos, hippos, stuff like that in veterinary practice because for a very small volume that, of drug that you can get into a blow dart or a, a rifle dart, you can actually get a lot of potency in that for the volume. And it knocks them down quick. It's very rapidly absorbed. Uh, for this reason, it's not used in humans because um, 
while you can weight base dose it in humans, the volumes are so incredibly small, the risk of error is substantial. So that's why it has never been really used um, in, in human medicine much at all, if at all. But uh, that small volume and high potency makes it ideal for smuggling. That small volume, high potency, in fact, it's a fentanyl, fentanyl analog. Uh, makes it easily produced in these small uh, pharmaceutical companies overseas, particularly in China, but not only in China, and then smuggled. Um, so for the same volume, a couple keys of heroin, you can get a much higher profit margin for what basically amounts to 20 or 30 cc's of carfentanil. Um, so you can see the economic advantage there. Now they think that carf, uh, you know, we talk about fentanyl and it got, it's certainly got its press over the past few years. Uh, they think fentanyl contributed to Prince's death. And what's interesting to me is that Prince, when he overdosed, he overdosed what we believe more, more than likely, I mean, hasn't been confirmed, was counterfeit fentanyl or counterfeit oxycodone or oxycontin uh, pills. Because at the same time in California, there was a big batch of counterfeit oxycontin pills being sold on the street that were actually uh, fentanyl. And uh, car, uh, these fentanyl source, these fentanyl analogs, because the quality control is so pure, some of these pills would have over a gram of fentanyl and some of them would have very little at all. There was a couple of case reports of uh, deaths related to this that, you know, obviously besides Prince's death that made the ERs and uh, the f uh, forensic science journals and forensic toxicology journals. So you can look them up. They're pretty interesting. This was not unique to California. All over the United States during this time period, we're seeing huge batches of heroin or what was sold as heroin that had fentanyl and other compounds mixed in it to increase its potency as a cutting agent. So uh, the profit margin was higher. And we saw a lot of organizations along in, along the eastern half of the United States dealing with this in California. It was a big deal. It's not the only problem we have to deal with. We have to deal with diversion. Diversion is essentially um, where you'd have medications that are prescribed for a legitimate legitimate medications prescribed for legitimate uh, clinical purposes that are then diverted to the illicit drug market or for illicit use so this is grandma with her bottle of uh, percocet for her back pain uh, and then you have the home health care nurse or home health aide who swipes a little bit of it the teenagers come over to visit grandma they swipe a little bit of it uh, the paramedics or people who come into the house, they might swipe a little bit, whatever it is. And you have, of course, the professional patients who see multiple physicians to get this, um, you know, from or they might go to pill mills, as they used to be called. And then it gets diverted into the illicit drug market. This is a problem. And I know some people might get a little spunk. Well, what do you mean paramedics? Does? It happens. It happens. Matter of fact, I personally have known uh, several paramedics who've died from opioid addiction. And uh, they start out with prescription opioids. They aren't starting out, you know, shooting drugs on the street. And then they unfortunately uh, go down a dark path from that. We are the only profession. We're just going a little soapbox here. We're the only profession that I know that can go into a stranger's home, say, hey, give me all your drugs. And families will, with a smile on their face, put all their drugs in a, in a plastic baggie, hand it to us to go to the hospital with grandma. And then there's we're all alone with it in the back of the rig. Now, I think that 99.9% .9 of us do the right thing. But that 1% who suffers from addiction, or whatever the percentage is, uh, it's a big temptation. So we always need to be our brother's keeper in this. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of opioids we have to struggle with. A lot of times we'll break these into kind of artificial categories legal versus legal synthetic versus naturally occurring clinical versus recreational all opioids belong to the same family and they kind of have the same toxidrome now there are two exceptions to that i specifically want to mention one is uh methadone and the other one's loperamide and we'll talk about that in a few minutes uh, but they all have the same kind of appearance i shouldn't say appearance the same type of flavor to the way the recreational overdoses look now, all the different opioid, I shouldn't say all, but uh, when you think about opioid compounds, they all largely originate from uh, opium itself uh, and the opium latex. We talked about that where we have the four major compounds, morphine, thebane, codeine, or Uh But then they derive from there. So first we're going to talk about the naturally occurring opioids, and that's, of course, morphine. 
Morphine, I like to think of as the benchmark opioid. When I say benchmark, I mean anything that you read when it talks about any opioids, they always say it's as potent as morphine or a hundred times more potent than morphine, a thousand times more potent than morphine. And a lot of that just kind of, I don't want to say it's hype, but it, it kind of misleads you. Fentanyl, fentanyl acetate or fentanyl citrate, which is what we most commonly use in emergency medical services, is a hundred times more potent than morphine. But what you see is we use it clinically equivalent dose. That's why we may give 10 milligrams of morphine, but a hundred micrograms of fentanyl. We're using a clinically equivalent dose. It's not a big deal. We do it all the time with lots of different things. Uh, so don't get too spun, spun up when they say it's so many more times potent than morphine, but morphine's kind of the benchmark, so we all have a common point of reference. It was first isolated in 19, or sorry, 1804, and first IV use, we believe, was about 1857. And that's an interesting story I'm going to share with you briefly. So there's a physician who developed the hypodermic needle, and I want to say 1856. And he developed the hypodermic needle for the main purpose of helping his wife inject opium or morphine, which is something she was addicted to. Previous to that, you would often just drink um, laudanum or some other opium or smoke it in an opium den or something along those lines. So he developed the uh, uh, hypodermic needle um, in 1856 and 1857 for largely for his wife he patented and of course he made money off of it and his wife promptly overdosed from uh, morphine in 1858 so it's kind of a uh, ominous turn of events a cautionary tale there oh uh, morphine does come in pill form and you see that with ms cotton and uh, extended release versions of that coding also natural occurring in the plant and uh, hydrocodone, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is also derived from it. Codeine, uh, we see most often used as a cough suppressant. Uh, and hydrocodone, of course, is a painkiller as well. And a lot of times you say, hear people say, well, I don't like codeine because it itches and it makes me feel this way where um, other painkillers make me feel a different way. It's because they really are different uh, opioid alkaloids and not one isn't derived from the other it's significantly different so they have a kind of a different flavor uh coding tends to be less euphoric more dysphoric in my experience and what i've talked to people we have the semi-synthetic opioids when you hear the term semi-synthetic what it means is they took one of the four naturally occurring opioids and processed it synthesized a compound from it so it starts a naturally occurring opioid alkaloid and now it's something different and the one we're most familiar with is heroin which is derived from morphine and Dilaudid, also derived from morphine. Oxycodone was derived from Thebane. Hydrocodone was derived from codeine. You get the idea. Heroin has been around for quite a long time. You get this picture is actually from, I want to say, the Sears and Roebuck catalog. You used to be able to buy hypodermic needles with complementary heroin, uh, I think a gr half a gram of heroin or something like that, that come with it from Sears and Roebuck. Um, it was a common pharmaceutical compound. We talk about uh, oxycodone. Oxycodone semi-synthetic derived from Thebane, twice as potent as morphine. Uh, whenever you look at a lot of the oxycodone and hydrocodone compounds, a lot of times they occur, they're distributed in a pill form with another uh, drug with it, like an NSAID, such as aspirin or Tylenol. Incidentally, um, there is a whole clinical, um, I don't want to say a syndrome, but uh, it's a common clinical presentation where you'll have pe patients develop hepatitis and liver failure who are opioid addicts. And they do it because they consume so much um, of an opioid that contains Tylenol uh, mixed in with it, such as Norco or whatever, or Vicodin, over such a, long, such a period of time that they actually, the Tylenol, even though they're abusing the opioid, the Tylenol kills their liver because they're taking so much of it. And it's a cumulative effect. Dilaudid, uh, it, man, this is a hammer. Uh, hydromorphone, morphone, it's, direct, it's derived from morphine. And clinically, both pharmacologically um, and subjectively, it's probably the closest we have to heroin in, that's legally uh, in our pharmacopoeia in the United States. Uh, heroin um, is actually uh, 
um, in other nations' pharmacopoeia as well. Our version is Dilaudid. It's not technically not heroin, but it has a very similar clinical profile. Um, you can abuse this IV. It comes in liquid form. Um, it's out there. And I have to tell you, uh, my best friend uh, growing up with, he actually overdosed and died from a compound, uh, a combination of both uh, Dilaudid and cocaine. He was speed bone with this and it, it got the best of him. So this is not uh, an uncommon thing. When you get into the synthetic opioids, uh, lots of different uses for these. The ones that we are mainly familiar with are going to be methadone, loperamide, and all the various fentanyl analogs. When we talk about the fentanyl analogs, of course, there's fentanyl acetate and fentanyl citrate that we use on the ambulance. There's the carfentanil you hear about uh, in the press, but also duragesic, fentanyl patches. These are extremely common, and this is an example of a... I got this uh, off a um, website for recovering addicts where they're this lady was showing, you know, how she would use. I personally have seen, a, I had a kid that was once shot uh, in a drug deal gone bad and he had a bunch of uh, red uh, kind of just like what you see here, marks all over his chest from chronically wearing fentanyl patches. He had never done IV drugs ever, but he uh, somehow had become fentanyl, addicted to fentanyl or addicted to opioids through fentanyl patches and actually was a student in a very prominent and prestigious local high school. And uh, so you can see these without the always shooting up heroin or anything like that. This is a whole different group of people who are also abusing. Now, if you hear the term methadone, you're probably thinking, well, that's for getting people off of opioids. And that's not entirely accurate. It's for maintaining people on opioids while they get weaned off is the theory. Now, when I say maintaining, what they what we're talking about is where they give them an opioid, an open opioid maintenance program. Get, they give them an opioid to mitigate the cravings so they can lead, lead a more normal life, a more productive life. And some of those people will titrate down to eventually get off opioids, but quite a few never do. Now, regardless of which way you fall and whether that's an effective methodology or not, methadone uh, is one of the ones they use for that. Suboxone is another one. And there are a group of people that will never get off opioids that will be on uh, some sort of opioid replacement therapy for the rest of their life. Now, methadone is what you think of most commonly for that. However, methadone is also used for pain control. It's also used, uh, actually, now that uh, the DEA has cracked down pretty heavily on OxyContin uh, as a drug of abuse, um, you see a lot, of a lot of physicians have switched over from prescribing OxyContin to methadone because it's a similar clinical profile and it's very effective for severe pain. Related, now this is, this is a synthetic drug, related to methadone is loperamide, also known as Imodium. Now, I would caution you about this. Uh, you will see this as a antidiarrheal. You can get it in drugstores and Walmart, so on and so forth. Some places have moved it behind the counter uh, where you have to show a driver's license to get it, but it's, it's not a prescribed, it's not, not, not something you have to get from a pharmacist usually. Now, it's gained a reputation as a poor man's methadone. So you will have people that if they can't get their opioid or they're trying to uh, go through uh, detox off of it, they will use very high doses of loperamide, of Imodium, to wean them off. You will have other patient, patients who have become addicted to Imodium, so they will actually take high doses of Imodium and supplement it with lower doses of their other opioids as well. And when we talk about how much, so your normal maximum daily dose, I want to say is somewhere around 16 milligrams. And there are people using up to 200 milligrams a day to give you an idea of how much they're using. And, you know, I've actually seen, seen this in my clinical practice in, field as well, in, the, in the field as well. Now, here's the really bad thing about this. Both methadone and loperamide, and this is variable by patient. So it's hard to say that 200 milligrams in one patient will look the same as 200 milligrams in another patient. There's quite a bit of variability, but they have a cardiac effect that most other opioids do not have. So they can prolong the QT interval. They can lower the threshold, the irritability uh, for VTAC and VFib that you can have torsade to points and what they call ventricular tachycardia storms. And these are often refractory to antiarrhythmics and electrical therapy because their mechanism is different. Um, their mechanism is through calcium channel blockade, uh, sodium blockade, 
um, and stuff of that nature. These are very difficult, very problematic to, to deal with. And I've seen uh, some cardiac arrest resultant from this. So how do you care for a patient with an opioid overdose? Well, if the first if the first thing in your mind you came to was naloxone, by the time you're done with this, I hope you have a different perspective. I would the first thing I tell people when we deal with opioid overdoses is that these are altered mental status patients first, then opioid overdoses. Because I've seen plenty of cases where people focus in on the opioid part and miss the head trauma. They miss the bleed. They miss the uh, other very severe life-threatening condition. So go down your all your differentials, manage the basics, go down all your differentials, make sure you're not missing something. Because if you miss something and you waste a lot of time with giving them Narcan and more Narcan and more Narcan, uh, you can actually, that delay can have catastrophic consequences for your patient. So keep that in mind. Uh, example would be the hypoglycemic. And we've seen this, I'm sure everybody's seen examples of this where um, certain lay people are given tons of Narcan to a patient and their blood sugar is just low or they've hit their head and they have a bleed or something like that. So when we look at our treatment, we devise our treatment strategy for opioids, we need to understand what, why these patients die. These patients die from respiratory failure and airway failure. Those are their primary causes of mortality. Their secondary causes relay that are aspiration and respiratory failure from that. Occasionally, hypothermia and hypotension. And usually, the hypothermia is situational, depending on where they pass out. There are other situational factors, you know, if they get in a car wreck while they overdose, something like that. And a big one is mistreatment by uh, EMS providers, or should I just EMS providers, by healthcare providers, atrogenic causes, where we make the situation worse than they code. So, regardless, when you have somebody who has deep, decreased airway and respiratory drive, uh, air, or airway functions, respiratory drive, this is your first line treatment. Good, gentle, I need to update this picture, but good, gentle, uh, two person airway control. So, you got the head tilt, chin lift, ear sternal notch should have an adjunct there. And uh, if this were to happen in my agency today, what you would see is you'd see a pressure manometer. Let me get a little handy dandy thing. You get you see a pressure manometer on your uh, top of your bag right here and a peep valve right here. And you'd be, and possibly an internal CO2 right here and slowly, gently ventilating. Just enough to get air in out of the lungs, just enough to get chest rise and fall, not enough to push air into the stomach, right? While you then, chose your best route and your best uh, method for your next treatment. Now, it's worth knowing that if you're early in the event, you may not need to do anymore. So I always tell people get two minutes of ventilation before you give any naloxone. Because what happens is certain drugs like heroin and Dilaudid cross the blood brain so quickly, blood brain barriers so quickly, they will go down sometimes with the needle still in their neck or their arm. In this phase, because it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it hammers them down, and then they'll plateau out. Now, they may be down somewhere down here, but the respiratory drive is still knocked out. Now, of course, there's other opioids that will cross and you know have a higher threshold and the respiratory drive will be suppressed. But a lot of your patients are in this gray area here. And what that means is if you oxygenate them, you ventilate them, sometimes they will come up enough. Now, they won't wake up. But sometimes they'll come up enough where you don't need to give them naloxone or you certainly don't need to give them a lot of naloxone. Just enough to keep them breathing and you've won the day. Keep in mind that even uh, any of the opioids can cause respiratory depression if they take enough of it. A lot of times people go, well, what if? What if? Don't we still need to give naloxone? No. Remember, nobody dies of a naloxone deficit. Naloxone does not exist in the body. It's not essential for life. They die from iliary failure and respiratory failure. When you control those two problems and you prevent aspiration, then you have time to be more selective, more judicious, to be more careful and give just, you know, be more uh, appropriate with other interventions after that. So we look at naloxone. Of course, it's a narcotic antagonist. It's one of two main ones available in our market, but it's the only one that's available cheaply. Uh, it usually takes effect when you administer it IV or intranasally, usually in two or three minutes, not always. And they say that higher doses may be needed for synthetic opioids. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But in order to talk about that, you need to know what an antagonist is. Now, what an antagonist is, we like to use the, uh, uh, the analogy of a lock and key. 
a receptor plugs into the lock, the uh, opi opioid drug, uh, which is the key, plugs into the receptor, which is the lock, and then it turns it for whatever effect that receptor is going to produce. Now, what an antagonist does, it's the equivalent of sticking a key into the lock and breaking it off so no other key can go in there. So it doesn't turn the receptor on, but it prevents other receptors from, or other opioids from doing it. Now, the problem is that naloxone typically lasts about 20 to 30 minutes, give or take. Uh, so it's not a cure. It's not a long-term uh, antidote. You may have to re-administer it. Now, if you give too much, if you give it too fast, if you give it uh, too aggressively, so to speak, then what you may cause is what we sometimes call opioid withdrawal. Now, there's a big difference here. If you are an opioid addict and you go into withdrawal on your own because you haven't consumed enough opioids or whatever your method of choice is, you will go into an uh, opioid withdrawal that may last several days. It'll be miserable, but very seldom will it be fatal or life-threatening. This is different than the opioid withdrawal we, re we institute. Uh, by giving too much Narcan. When we institute opioid withdrawal through that mechanism, we call, we, we produce something called precipitous opioid withdrawal. And this sudden severe opioid withdrawal can actually cause what has been characterized as a catecholamine storm. And when we talk about catecholamine storm, imagine a sudden and severe uh, rest, uh, dump of epinephrine, a dump of adrenaline in, systemically. Now, what's the bad thing about this? Well, Imagine you've been down 15, 20 minutes from an opioid overdose. Maybe not down enough being cardiac arrest, but down enough that, you know, you're, you're in a respiratory acidosis. And now you have a respiratory ac uh, acidotic brain, acidotic heart, some enterprising uh, firefighter, cop, paramedic comes along and dumps a whole bucket load of Narcan in your system. And you have this precipitous withdrawal. You suddenly have a catecholamine storm, a bunch of epinephrine hitting your acidotic brain. What does that look like? That looks like seizures. You have a bunch of uh, epinephrine hitting your acidotic heart. What does that look like? That looks like V-fib, V-tac, uh, tachycardias, tachydysrhythmias, and hypertension. What does that look like? Well, that then leads to pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema. Now, we used to, uh, w when... In the old days when this would happen, people go, oh, that's just withdrawal. That's not our fault. That's just That just happens. But there's been enough research to, in, to, to imply that you don't have those responses when you give low doses slowly. When you give half a milligram of Narcan instead of two milligrams, and you give it over a minute or two instead of as quickly as you can. When you slowly run it in, when you give slow doses just to keep them breathing, we don't have these effects, but when you do slam it, you have these bad effects and sometimes patients code and they go in cardiac arrest and it's bad news for everybody. The other thing I would advise is that let's look at the cause. So if we assume that the cause is from hypoxia and hypercarbia and acidosis, before we ever give the Narcan, let's give it two minutes of good ventilations, wash out that CO2, bring their CO2 down a little bit, not over bag them. I talked about the danger of that, but oxygenate them correct some of the hypercarbia, correct some of the acidosis, and then give a low, slow amount. You do this over two to four minutes instead of over 30 seconds, you save yourself a whole lot of problems. So that's really what we're talking about is avoiding bad outcomes, is, um, is limiting the, hyper, the effect of hypercarbia, hypoxia, and acidosis on the situation, limiting the catecholamine response by giving low, slow doses. BVM before Narcan. Now, I hear some people say, well, don't we need higher doses of Narcan for the fentanyl analogs and all that? And yes and no. So first thing to understand, there's a difference between uh, potency and affinity. A lot of times we're talk, when we talk about these drugs such as carfentanil and uh, fentanyl acetate and fentanyl citrate and the other fentanyls out there, uh, they, we, you hear a lot about the potency of the drug. That's so many more times potent than, the, than morphine. And that may be true. It's it's true often. But we don't talk about the affinity. And when we talk about antagonists, we need to consider the affinity of the drug. The affinity of the drug is the strength of the handshake of the receptor. So a drug with a weak handshake 
even though it may be very potent, can easily be knocked off by Narcan, where a drug, even a weak drug with a strong affinity, takes much more Narcan to bump it off. So I hope that makes sense. So in this case, we have the guy getting knocked out. That's the potency of the drug and the, uh, the grip of the drug is the affinity. And when we give Narcan, I'm as much concerned about the affinity of the drug than I am the, the potency of the drug. So, again, where do you start? You start low and you titrate your way up. So why do we give naloxone? Well, you give it for patients who, after airway control and after ventilation, they are still unconscious, they have poor respiratory drive, and maybe they have pinpoint pupils. You do not need pinpoint pupils to give naloxone. I think I already talked about this. There's, you know, op uh, stimulants can, can mask this, uh, head injury. Um, we talked about um, acidosis can cause your pupils to dilate, lots of things. So I don't, I don't rely on pinpoint pupils to absolutely give opioids. I rely on the total clinical picture and the other clues on the scene. So where, where, when do I decide to give opioids? Well, if the patient is looking at me, if they're engaging, even if it's minimally, if they can uh, follow any instructions, can they hold a cup, even if it's poorly? Can they, this is the two big ones. If they can swallow or cough on command, I know they uh, have the respiratory or the airway functions intact. I'm probably not going to give them naloxone. What am I going to do? I'm going to sit them up at 30 degrees or higher. I'm going to keep them stimulated enough where they are somewhat awake. Uh, I will give them supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula uh, and I will watch their airway closely. Now, what I will do is I may still probably get an IV some IV access. I may have that naloxone out so I can give it if I need to. But I'm just not going to give it just because they uh, have a context of an opioid overdose and they're sluggish. So let's talk about what's the best way to give it. Now, I, I know a lot of agencies, even paramedic agencies, are giving intranasal. Uh, and we're, I want to talk about that in a little minute. So what's the best route? Whether it's, It really depends what your options are, uh, whether you're looking at IM, IN, or IV. So when we talk about uh, this, each of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. And it comes with a lot of compounds. So you probably have seen uh, this with the mucosal atomizer. You have seen this with the uh, small syringe with the 21 or 24 gauge needle on it. You may have also seen these pre-filled uh, nasal atomizers, which are very common with law enforcement in my area. These are also incredibly, almost silly, expensive. Uh, you may see, believe it or not, there are Narcan auto injectors. So this company makes, um, this is an alternative to the EpiPen, a competitor. I don't know if they still make the EpiPen. Uh, I haven't seen them in a while. I think they transitioned over. But this is a uh, Narcan auto injector. It's about the size of a cigarette pack. And it has two needles. And what's really interesting about this, it also has a voice uh, a voice prompt to guide you through. You know, remove the pack cap press firmly against the thigh, you know, that type of thing to talk people through this. This is also, both this and the EpiPen version were incredibly expensive as well, but they were useful. You also see uh, some pre-made kits, like here are a couple examples for intra intramuscular. Um, these were actually handed out uh, to drug addicts, to their families, and to law enforcement, other public safety and public well, not just the public safety agencies, but people who work with, you know, in methadone clinics, people who work with addiction, uh, addiction, people who are working with the homeless, they might have these available to them too in shelters. So a lot of different venues. Um, and there's various cost price points to these as well. So what's the advantage of intranasal? Well, in a nutshell, the advantage of intranasal, whether you're giving it with the very expensive uh, four milligrams intranasal here, or the two milligrams for the atomizer here, no needles. When you look at the reason why most people go to this, it's no needles. So the train, you sim simply stick it up the nose and squirt it. The training um, load, the training uh, obligation is much less. It's easier to teach. The downside, um, while the literature supports that it's roughly 80 to 80% 80 equivalent to IV use, uh, in the in the laboratory setting, there's a lot of variability in practical everyday street level use of this. 
Um, that depends on how far people stick, stick it up the nose. It depends on the patient's individual anatomy, their perfusion of that mucosal membrane, if they're in cardiac arrest or nearly in cardiac arrest, um, how it's stored, if it's stored in somebody's glove box where it gets hot because Narcan does not do well with heat compared to other drugs. Lots of different variables in this. But everybody's afraid of getting stuck with the needles, so you see this has probably become the most common method. Uh, and large, like I said, because they're afraid of needle sticks. If you are, and I think for cops, probably for BLS agencies with a low volume, for um, non-healthcare workers working with uh, people at risk, I think that this is fine. I think as healthcare providers, we have some better options, honestly, although I may be in a minority on that. Uh, and if you, if you are absolutely married to a non IV use, I intramuscular. Now, the reason people don't like this is, well, number one is it has a needle and I can understand that. Um, that said, the rate of absorption is, uh, while not comparable to IV, it's a little bit slower, which sometimes is a good thing. It is, uh, we know it all gets in there. It doesn't run down the back of the throat. Uh, the downside is you have to have a large enough muscle mass that's perfused enough for it to actually distribute throughout the body. But if I were to pick for an agency, which I would go to, if I had to pick one or the other between intranasal and intramuscular, it would be intramuscular. Um, but, you know, like I said, both have pros and cons. Now for paramedics, for people, advanced EMTs, people who can start IVs and administer drugs through that route, I still go with intravenous. The nice thing about intravenous is I can give a much smaller smaller amount uh, with a, I can titrate it. I can manage it better and give just enough to get them breathing without enough to cause a rodeo. So that's what I like. Now, your program, your protocol may have, diff probably has different doses than what's there on the screen. This is my agency. Uh, we start between 0.1 and 2. So we start at a much smaller dose. Uh, at the paramedic's discretion, very, very, very rarely I, would I recommend anybody go above 0.5 for your initial dose. I just, it just doesn't make sense to me, both from pharmacological, when you look at uh, the pharmacokinetics, even with uh, possibly synthetic doses um, or synthetic uh, opioids that you need a lot more, start low. Uh, in all seriousness, just start low and titrate your way up. And keep in mind, you may have to readminster. Okay, so what do you do when naloxone doesn't work? Do you give more? Do you move on to other things? And there, there is no one-size-fits-all answer to this. You need to understand that naloxone, patients do not always respond to naloxone for a number of reasons. One is they took a bucket load of opioids and you haven't given enough. Another possible indication is that the toxicology toxicological emergency isn't solely due to opioids or they have multiple drugs besides opioids or additional opioids on. And in that case, naloxone will never be your solution. Uh, the other one possibility is that they have become hypoxic or anoxic in their brain and that um, until you resolve that, they won't respond or that they have so much damage, they're not going to respond in the period that we have them. And then of course, uh, that it's not opioids at all. And that's where your AEIOU tips stuff comes into play. The biggest thing to take in mind is that even if you get frustrated, oh, they're not responding. You only give them low doses of naloxone. And I recommend 0.5 milligrams or less at a time. Different protocols may say differently. And um, we could discuss that over a beer any day of the week. And, you know, and both of us be right. But the other thing to keep in mind is that there comes a point where you're not going to get a response uh, or, you know, that you're wasting time in naloxone. That's usually about 10 milligrams, probably a lot less, depending on what you're dealing with. Um, I can't remember the last time I've given a full 10 milligrams, which our protocol allows. Um, but I have had plenty of patients where I've moved on to just RSIing them and intubating them. If we, if I don't get anything remotely resembling response after about two to four milligrams, and uh, that's just clinical judgment. Um, you have to find out what's good for the types of opioids you're seeing in your system and be keep an open mind about it. But definitely, uh, the general consensus is anything above ten milligrams of naloxone is just fetal. So what about Narcan infusions? And Narcan infusions are an alternative to maintain uh, your clinical status after Narcan has worked. 
And so in essence, you've given a dose or a couple small doses of Narcan. You've gotten a respiratory drive back. They're somewhat wakeful. Or you're on a facility transport where they've received Narcan. And you want to maintain uh, their clinical status without the up and down that just rebolusing Narcan gives you. And the answer is a Narcan uh, uh, infusion. Now, what I have on there in the screen is uh, is pretty much our protocol, uh, slight variation, but there's a lot of different variations on this. So in our system, uh, for consistency, all of our infusions are in 250 ba uh, cc bags, and we mix four milligrams of Narcan in 250 cc's. Uh, your program may use 100 cc bags, they may use Bureau Charles, they may use 50 cc bags, they may use pre-mixed pre bags, whatever the case is. Just know what your system does, know how to mix it, and know how to, comp, you know, to do it in your pump. Our dose is between 0.1 and 10 milligrams an hour, titrate for effect. But the, the tricky thing is, where do you start? That's a huge range. And what our recommendation is, you start between 50 and 100% of your initial rescue dose. And your rescue dose is not the initial amount you gave, but the total amount you gave to get weight or to get your return of respiratory drive and or wakefulness, whatever it was you're shooting for. So we'll say it took you two milligrams to get there. Maybe you gave it over four doses, two doses, whatever, but it took you two milligrams to get to a satisfactory respiratory status with your patient. Then your infusion dose is between one and two mil uh, milligrams an hour. It's that simple. And that constant infusion should carry you through and for, for your transport and so on and so forth. Now, most EMS agencies won't need to do a uh, infusion, but if you're in a more rural part of the country, if you're doing any facility transports, uh, anything of that part, you might. So this is a good thing to have in the back of your pocket. Now, what about Narcan and cardiac arrest? Well, the 2020 uh, HA guidelines just came out, and uh, some previous guidelines said there is no role for routine use of naloxone and cardiac arrest. And I think people mistook the word routine. This is my personal parent, uh, position or personal opinion that they mistook the use of the word routine for all uses. And a better word than routine would be empiric, which means you just give it just because they're in cardiac arrest or whatever. Uh, it's always been justified if you dig into the guidelines that you could give naloxone when you suspected an opioid overdose was a, was a uh, contributing cause. Um, but it's also been in there that uh, it, it was never a first-line intervention. The 2020 guidelines, I think, are a little bit clearer on this, so I have them up here. And it says, because there's no studies for demonstrating improvement in patient outcomes, uh, provision of CPR should be the focus of initial care. I absolutely agree with, this. agree with this. Whether you give naloxone or whether you don't, it should never take the place of your standard ACLS care, should never take the place of high quality, high performance CPR. That should always come first. And then if you have the extra resource, the extra manpower, then squirt some Narcan up the nose, give it in the muscle, give it through your IO, give it through your IV, whatever's appropriate, as long as you don't interrupt your resuscitation otherwise. So I hope that's clear. The other thing, and I, there, if you look at the videos people give in Narcan, uh, both cops and lay people, and sometimes even professional providers. Uh, sometimes you'll see they roll up on an overdose. Uh, the patient's obviously in distress. They're gonzo. They may even be in cardiac arrest. And somebody s squats down. They squirt some Narcan up their nose. And then they wait for the magic to happen. Don't let this be you. No patient should wait uh, for uh, quality care, whether it be airway management or CPR, just because somebody gave them Narcan. Resuscitation, airway management always takes priority um, and get that done first and get that done continuously and get the Narcan in as you have time. Now, finally, are there any reasons you shouldn't use Narcan? And there are. Uh, first of all, your sim, uh, and we got the things there, semi-awake patients, your pregnant patients, aspiration and polypharm overdoses. And these aren't absolute rules, but these are good guidelines to consider. If you give it to a semi-awake patient, a patient who really doesn't need it, the patient who you can just stimulate enough verbally to keep them breathing, um, what you may end up having is a puddle pool of vomit. And this also may happen if you give it fast, if you give it, uh, if you just slam it. 
If you have a pregnant patient, uh, Narcan, because the catecholamine surge can cause a breath of the placenta, can cause preterm labor and fetal distress. Your first option for uh, uh, opioid overdose with a pregnant patient is airway management supplemental oxygen and let the mom continue to be the incubator. You don't want to be in a situation where, and uh, be honest, you may not have to deal with it, but somebody's going to have to deal with it where you have a 23 week or a 25 week or a 30 week or that suddenly has to be delivered in withdrawal because uh, we gave naloxone. We want to, we just don't want to do it. So it's an option of last resort. If you come up on this patient, even if it's an opioid overdose and they're, they're swimming in their own vomit and they have a swimming pool of vomit in the back of their throat, don't even bother with naloxone. This is my opinion. Uh, your medical director may be different, but our medical director supports this. Suction them out, intubate them. These patients are most likely going to go into respiratory failure and ARDS regardless of if you give Narcan or not. And the only thing given Narcan is, is going to do is take away one of the options for post-intubation management or delay airway management. So what we want to do instead is just suction the hell out of them. Uh, go in, LMA them, intubate them, whatever your advanced airway method of choice is. Uh, do your post intubation management and give them to the hospital where they'll be admitted to the ICU uh, and be managed both for their opioid overdose and the inevitable respiratory failure that goes hand in hand with it because they aspirated a bunch of gastric contents. Finally, um, occasionally you may encounter this. This is the hospice patient at home. This is the patient who uh, is palliative and uh, on their last legs of life. And then you get called because uh, there was the belief that they overdosed by accident. And this is usually a case where a patient uh, was given uh, some palliative doses of opioids and then they had a deterioration. Now in this one journal, um, in this one journal, they talked about how often are these actually opioid related and 80% of them are just end of life deterioration. Less than 20% of them were possibly opioid related. And in all these cases, I, God, it's just, I don't have words to describe how inhumane it might be just to give them a bunch of, op of Narcan, you know, their last few days on this earth. Uh, and then you take away all their pain control and it just, it's, it's incredibly, um, I don't have the good words for it, but it's just inhumane. So what do you do? Well, it, you know, there is a, uh, nanogram for uh, how to administer naloxone in these patients, and it's very small doses. When I say very small doses, it's usually uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 milligrams every 30 seconds slowly uh, until you get respiratory drive. Uh, most of us aren't don't haven't practiced diluting and drawing that up, but you could. Um, and that's, you know, and most of us don't have protocols that even I don't have protocols that permit that. I'd have to call a doctor and get permission to do that. But that is that's what I would do if I had a, a palliative patient. I would manage their airway. I would call my doc and I would say I would express my concern about giving uh, normal doses of naloxone to a patient who's chronically on opioids, who's at the end of life. And I would try to find an alternative solution. That alternative solution may be call their hospice doctor. It may be maybe the ER doctor you're talking to has an option. Uh, but normal doses in these patients is generally inhumane. So buy yourself some time by air, managing their airway and contact medical control um, with the solution. And that brings us to the end. Uh, stay up to date uh, with your knowledge on street drugs. Don't believe the hype that you see on CNN and other stuff. Find convergent validity from re reputable sources. Remember that overdose patients are altered mental status patients first. Don't go to the locks and stray off the bat. Rule out all the other causes. And before you give naloxone, make sure you've done what you can to correct hypoxia, correct acidosis, and correct hypercarbia with gentle, uh, judicious BVM use. When you do give Narcan, give it like a low rider, low and slow. And remember, your goal is airway and respiratory correction, not to wake them up. So I hope this has been useful. I hope this hasn't been too tedious for you. And uh, if you have any questions, you know where to get a hold of me. Thank you for your time.